Chapter Twenty Six of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six. Hannah Heath's wedding day dawned bright enough for a less calculating bride. David did not get home until half past three. He had been obliged to drive out to the starting place of the new railroad near Albany, where it was important that he get a few points correctly. On the morrow was to be the initial trip, by the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad, of the first train drawn by a steam engine in the state of New York. His article about it, bargained for by a New York paper, must be on its way by special post as soon after the starting of the train as possible. He must have all items accurate, technicalities of preparation, description of engine and coaches, details of arrangements, etc., before he added the final paragraphs describing the actual start of the train. His article was practically done now, save for these few items. He had started early that morning on his long drive, and, being detained longer than he had expected, arrived at home with barely time to put himself into wedding garments and hasten in at the last moment with Marcia, who stood quietly waiting for him in the front hall. They were the last guests to arrive. It was time for the ceremony, but the bride, true to her nature to the last, still kept Lemuel waiting, and Lemuel, true to the end, stood smiling and patient, awaiting her pleasure. David and Marcia entered the wide parlor and shook hands here and there with those assembled, though for the most part a hushed air pervaded the room, as it always does when something is about to happen. Soon after their arrival, someone in purple silk came down the stairs and seated herself in a vacant chair close to where the bride was to stand. She had gold hair and eyes like forget-me-nots. She was directly opposite to David and Marcia. David was engrossed in a whispered conversation with Mr. Brentwood about the events of the morrow and did not notice her entrance, though she paused in the doorway and searched him directly from amongst the company before she took her seat. Marcia, who was talking with Rose Brentwood, caught the vision of purple and gold and turned to face for one brief instant the scornful, half-merry glance of her sister. The blood in her face fled back to her heart and left it white. Then Marcia summoned all her courage and braced herself to face what was to come. She forced herself to smile in answer to Rose Brentwood's question but all the while she was trying to understand what was in her sister's look that had hurt her so. It was not the anger, for that she was prepared. It was not the scorn, for she had often faced that. Was it the almost merriment? Yes, there was the sting. She had felt it so keenly when as a little girl Kate had taken to making fun of some whim of hers. She could not see why Kate should find cause for fun just now. It was as if she, by her look, ignored Marcia's relation to David in scornful laugh and appropriated him herself. Marcia's inmost soul rebelled. The color came back as if by force of her will. She would show Kate, or she would show David at least, that she could bear all things for him. She would play well her part of wife this day. The happy two months that had passed since David came back from New York had made her almost feel as if she really was his and he hers. For this hour she would forget that it was otherwise. She would look at him and speak to him as if he had been her husband for years, as if there were the truest understanding between them, as indeed of a certain wistful, pleasant sort there was. She would not let the dreadful thought of Kate cloud her face for others to see. Bravely she faced the company, but her heart under Kate's blue frock sent up a swift and pleading prayer demanding of a higher power something she knew she had not in herself, and must therefore find in him who created her. It was the most trustful and needy prayer that Marcia ever uttered, and yet there were no words, not even the closing of an eyelid. Only her heart took the attitude of prayer. The door upstairs opened in a business-like way, and Hannah's composed voice was heard giving a direction. Hannah's silken tread began to be audible. Miranda told Marcia afterward that she kept her standing at the window for an hour beforehand to see when David arrived, 
and when they started over to the house. Hannah kept herself posted on what was going on in the room below as if she were down there. She knew where David and Marcia stood, and told Kate exactly where to go. It was like Hannah that in a moment of her sacrifice of the long-cherished hopes of her life, she should have planned a dramatic revenge to help carry her through. The bride's rustle became at last so audible that even David and Mr. Brentwood heard and turned from their absorbing conversation to the business at hand. Hannah was in the doorway when David looked up, very cold and beautiful in her bridal array despite the years she had waited, and almost at once David saw the vision in purple and gold like a saucy pansy standing near her. Kate's eyes were fixed upon him with their most bewitching, dancing smile of recognition, like a naughty little child who had been in hiding for a time, and now peeps out laughing over the discomfiture of its elders. So Kate encountered the steadfast gaze of David's astonished eyes. But there was no light of love in those eyes as she had expected to see. Instead, there grew in his face such a blaze of righteous indignation as the lord of the wedding feast might have turned upon the person who came in without a wedding garment. In spite of herself, Kate was disconcerted. She was astonished. She felt that David was challenging her presence there. It seemed to her he was looking through her, searching her, judging her, sentencing her, and casting her out, and presently his eyes wandered beyond her through the open hall door and out into God's green world and when they came back and rested upon her, his look had frozen into the glance of a stranger. Angry, ashamed, baffled, she bit her lips in vexation, but tried to keep the merry smile. In her heart she hated him, and vowed to make him bow before her smiles once more. David did not see the bride at all to notice her, but the bride, unlike the one of the psalmist's vision whose eyes were upon her dear bridegroom's face, was looking straight across the room with evident intent to observe David. The ceremony proceeded, and Hannah went through her part correctly and calmly, aware that she was giving herself to Lemuel Skinner irrevocably, yet perfectly aware also of the discomfiture of the sweet-faced girl-wife who sat across the room gravely watching the ceremony with white cheeks and eyes that shone like righteous lights. Marcia did not look at David. She was with him in heart, suffering with him, feeling for him, quivering in every nerve for what he might be enduring. She had no need to look. Her part was to ignore and help to cover. They went through it all well. Not once did Aunt Amelia or Aunt Hortense notice anything strange in the demeanor of their nephew or his wife. Aunt Clorinda was not there. She was not fond of Hannah. As soon as the service was over and the relatives had broken the solemn hush by kissing the bride, David turned and spoke to Rose Brentwood, making some smiling remark about the occasion. Rose Brentwood was looking her very prettiest in a rose-sprigged delaine and her wavy dark hair in a beaded net tied round with a rose-colored lute-string ribbon. Kate flushed angrily at this. If it had been Marcia to whom he had spoken, she would have judged he did it out of pique, but a pretty stranger coming upon the scene at this critical moment was trying. And then, too, David's manner was so indifferent, so utterly natural. He did not seem in the least troubled by the sight of herself. David and Marcia did not go up to speak to the bride at once. David stepped back into the deep window seat to talk with Mr. Brentwood, and seemed to be in no hurry to follow the procession who were filing past the calm bride to congratulate her. Marcia remained quietly talking to Rose Brentwood. At last, David turned toward his wife with a smile as though he had known she was there all the time and had felt her sympathy. Her heart leaped up with new strength at that look, and her husband's firm touch, as he drew her hand within his arm to lead her over to the bride, gave her courage. She felt that she could face the battle, and with a bright smile that lit up her whole lively face, she marched bravely to the front, to do or to die. I had about given up expecting any congratulations from you, 
said Hannah sharply as they came near. It was quite evident she had been watching for them. I wish you much joy, Mrs. Skinner, said David mechanically, scarcely feeling that she would have it, for he knew her unhappy, dissatisfied nature. Yes, said Marcia, I wish you may be happy, as happy as I am. It was an impetuous, childish thing to say, and Marcia scarcely realized what words she meant to speak until they were out, and then she blushed a rosy red. Was she happy? Why was she happy? Yes, even in the present trying circumstances, she suddenly felt a great deep happiness bubbling up in her heart. Was it David's look and his strong arm under her hand? Hannah darted a look at her. She was stung by the words. But did the girl bride before her mean to flaunt her own triumphs in her face? Did she fully understand? Or was she trying to act a part and make them believe she was happy? Hannah was baffled once more, as she had been before with Marcia. Kate turned upon Marcia for one piercing instant again, that look of understanding, mocking merriment, which cut through the soul of her sister. But did Marcia imagine it, or was it true that at her words to Hannah, David's arm had pressed hers closer as they stood there in the crowd? The thought thrilled through her and gave her greater strength. Hannah turned toward Kate. David, she said, as she had always called him, and it was possible that she enjoyed the triumph of this touch of intimacy before her guest, you knew my friend Mrs. Leavenworth. David bowed gravely, but did not attempt to put out his hand to take the one which Kate offered in greeting. Instead, he laid it over Marcia's little trembling one on his arm, as if to steady it. We have met before said David briefly, in an impenetrable tone, and turning, passed out of the room to make way for the Brentwoods who were behind him. Hannah scarcely treated the Brentwoods with decency, so vexed was she with the way things were turning out. To think that David should so completely baffle her. She turned an annoyed look at Kate, who flashed her blue eyes contemptuously, as if to blame Hannah. Soon the whole little gathering were in the dining-room and wide hall, being served with Grandmother Heath's fried chicken and currant jelly, delicate soda biscuits, and fruit cake baked months before and left to ripen. The ordeal through which they were passing made David and Marcia feel, as they sat down, that they would not be able to swallow a mouthful, but strangely enough they found themselves eating with relish, each to encourage the other perhaps, but almost enjoying it, and feeling that they had not yet met more than they could be able to withstand. Kate was seated on the other side of the dining-room, by Hannah, and she watched the two incessantly with that half-merry contemptuous look, toying with her own food, and apparently waiting for their acting to cease, and David to put on his true character. She never doubted for an instant that they were acting. The wedding supper was over at last. The guests crowded out to the front stoop to bid good-bye to the happy bridegroom and cross-looking bride, who seemed as if she left the gala scene reluctantly. Marcia, for the instant, was separated from David, who stepped down upon the grass and stood to one side to let the bridal party pass. The minister was at the other side. Marcia had slipped into the shelter of Aunt Amelia's black silk presence, and wished she might run out the back door and away home. Suddenly a shimmer of gold with the sunlight through it caught her gaze, and a glimpse of sheeny purple. There, close behind David, standing upon the top step, quite unseen by him, stood her sister Kate. Marcia's heart gave a quick thump and seemed to stop, then went painfully laboring on. She stood quite still, watching for the moment to come when David would turn around and see Kate, that she might look into his face and read there what was written. Hannah had been put carefully into the carriage by the adoring Lemuel, with many a pat and a shaking of cushions, and an adjustment of curtains to suit her whim. It pleased Hannah, now in her last lingering moment of freedom, to be exacting and show others what a slave her husband was. They all stood for an instant looking after the carriage, but Marcia watched David. 
then just as the carriage wound around the curve in the road and was lost from view she saw him turn and at once knew she must not see his face as he looked at kate closing her eyes like a flash she turned and fled upstairs to get her shawl and bonnet there she took refuge behind the great white curtains and hid her face for several minutes praying wildly she hardly knew what thankful that she had been kept from the sight which yet she had longed to behold as david turned to go up the steps and search for marcia he was confronted by kate's beautiful smiling face radiant as it used to be when it had first charmed him he exulted as he looked into it that it did not any longer charm david you don't seem a bit glad to see me blamed kate sweetly in her pretty childish tones looking into his face with those blue eyes so like to liquid skies almost there was a hint of tears in them he had been wont to kiss them when she looked like that now he felt only disgust as some of the flippant sentences in her letters to harry temple came to his mind his face was stern and unrecognizing david you are angry with me yet you said you would forgive the gentle reproach minimized the crime and enlarged the punishment. It was Kate's way. The pretty pout on the rosy lips was the same as it used to be when she chided him for some trifling forgetfulness of her wishes. The other guests had all gone into the house now. David made no response, but, nothing daunted, Kate spoke again. I have something very important to consult you about. I came here on purpose. Can you give me some time tomorrow morning? She wrinkled her pretty face into a thousand dimples and looked her most bewitching, like a naughty child who knew she was loved in spite of anything, and coquettishly putting her head on one side, added, in the tone she used of old to cajole him, You know you never could refuse me anything, David. David did not smile. He did not answer the look. With a voice that recognized her only as a stranger, he said gravely, I have an important engagement tomorrow morning. But you will put off the engagement. She said it confidently. It is impossible, said David decidedly. I am starting quite early to drive over to Albany. I am under obligation to be present at the starting of the new steam railroad. Oh, how nice! said kate clapping her hands childishly i have wanted to be there and now you will take me then i we can talk on the way how like old times that will be she flashed him a smile of molten sunshine alluring and transforming that too is impossible mrs leavenworth my wife accompanies me he answered her promptly and clearly and with a curt bow left her and went into the house kate leavenworth was angry and for kate to be angry meant to visit it upon some one the offender if possible if not the nearest to the offender she had failed utterly in her attempt to win back the friendship of her former lover she had hoped to enjoy his attention to a certain extent and bathe her sad heart in the wistful glances of the man she had jilted and incidentally perhaps be invited to spend a little time in his house by which she would contrive to have a good many of her own ways. A rich brother-in-law who adored one was not a bad thing to have, especially when his wife was one's own little sister, whom one had always dominated. She was tired of New York, and at this season of the year the country was much more preferable. She could thus contrive to hoard her small income and save for the next winter, as well as secure a possible entrance finally into her father's good graces again through the forgiveness of David and Marcia. But she had failed. Could it be that he cared for Marcia? That child! Scout the idea! She would discover at once. Hurriedly she searched through the rooms downstairs and then went stealthily upstairs. Instinctively she went to the room where Marcia had hidden herself. Marcia, with that strong upward breath of prayer, had grown steady again. She was standing with her back to the door, looking out of the window toward her own home, when Kate entered the room. Without turning about, she felt Kate's presence and knew that it was she. 
the moment had come. She turned around, her face calm and sweet, with two red spots upon her cheeks, and her bonnet, Kate's bonnet and shawl, Kate's fine lace shawl sent from Paris, grasped in her hands. They faced each other, the sisters, and much was understood between them in a flash without a word spoken. Marcia suddenly saw herself standing there in Kate's rightful place, Kate's things in her hands, Kate's garments upon her body, Kate's husband held by her. It was as if Kate charged her with all these things, as she looked her through and over, from her slipper-tips to the ruffle around the neck. And, oh, the scorn that flamed from Kate's eyes playing over her, and scorching her cheeks into crimson, and burning her lips dry and stiff! And yet when Kate's eyes reached her face and charged her with the supreme offense of taking David from her, Marcia's eyes looked bravely back, and were not burned by the fire, and she felt that her soul was not even scorched by it. Something about the thought of David, like an angelic presence, seemed to save her. The silence between them was so intense that nothing else could be heard by the two. The voices below were drowned by it, the footstep on the stair was as if it were not. At last Kate spoke, angered still more by her sister's soft eyes, which gazed steadily back and did not droop before her own flashing onslaught. Her voice was cold and cruel. There was nothing sisterly in it, nothing to remind either that the other had ever been beloved. Fool! hissed Kate. Silly fool! Did you think you could steal a husband as you stole your clothes? Did you suppose marrying David would make him yours, as putting on my clothes seemed to make them yours? Well, I can tell you, he will never be a husband to you. He doesn't love you, and he never can. He will always love me. He's as much mine as if I had married him, in spite of all your attempts to take him. Oh, you needn't put up your baby mouth and pucker it as if you were going to cry. Cry away. It won't do any good. You can't make a man yours any more than you can make somebody's clothes yours. They don't fit you any more than he does. You look horrid in blue, and you know it, in spite of all your prinking around and pretending. I'd be ashamed to be tricked out that way and know that every dud I had was made for somebody else. As for going around and pretending you have a husband, it's a lie. You know he's nothing to you. You know he never told you he cared for you. I tell you he's mine, and he always will be. Kate, you're married, cried Marcia in shocked tones. How can you talk like that? Married? Nonsense! What difference does that make? It's hearts that count, not marriages. Has your marriage made you a wife? Answer me that. Has it? Does David love you? Does he ever kiss you? Yet he came to see me in New York this winter and took me in his arms and kissed me. He gave me money, too. See this brooch? She exhibited a jeweled pin. That was bought with his money. You see, he loves me still. I could bring him to my feet with a word today. He would kiss me if I asked him. He is weak as water in my hands. Marcia's cheeks burned with shame and anger. Almost she felt at the limit of her strength. For the first time in her life she felt like striking, striking her own sister. Horrified over her feelings and the rage which was tearing her soul, she looked up, and there stood David in the doorway, like some tall avenging angel. Kate had her back that way and did not see at once, but Marcia's eyes rested on him hungrily, pleadingly, and his answered hers. From her sudden calmness, Kate saw there was someone near, and turning, looked at David. But he did not glance her way. How much or how little he had heard of Kate's tirade, which in her passion had been keyed in a high voice, he never let them know, and neither dared to ask him, lest perhaps he had not heard anything. There was a light of steel in his eyes toward everything but Marcia, and his tone had in it kindness and a recognition of mutual understanding, as he said, If you are ready, we had better go now, dear, had we not? 
oh how gladly marcia followed her husband down the stairs and out the door she scarcely knew how she went through the formalities of getting away it seemed as she looked back upon them that david had sheltered her from it all and said everything needful for her and all she had done was to smile and assent he talked calmly to her all the way home told her mr brentwood's opinion about the change in the commerce of the country the new railroad was going to make told her though he must have known she would not listen perhaps both were conscious of the bedroom window over the way and a pair of blue eyes that might be watching them as they passed into the house david took hold of her arm and helped her up the steps of their own home as if she had been some great lady marcia wondered if kate saw that in her heart she blessed david for this outward sign of their relationship it gave her shame a little cover at least she glanced up toward the next house as she passed in and felt sure she saw a glimmer of purple move away from the window then david shut the door behind them and led her gently in End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven. He made her go into the parlor and sit down, and she was all unnerved by his gentle ways. The tears would come in spite of her. He took his own fine wedding handkerchief and wiped them softly off her hot cheeks. He untied the bonnet that was not hers and flung it far into a corner in the room. Marcia thought he put force into the fling. Then he unfolded the shawl from her shoulders and threw that into another corner. Kate's beautiful thread-lace shawl. Marcia felt a hysterical desire to laugh, but David's voice was steady and quiet when he spoke as one might speak to a little child in trouble. "'There now, dear,' he said. He had never called her dear before. There, that was an ordeal, and I'm glad it's over. It will never trouble us that way again. Let us put it aside and never think about it any more. We have our own lives to live. I want you to go with me tomorrow morning to see the train start if you feel able. We must start early, and you must take a good rest. Would you like to go? Marcia's face, like a radiant rainbow, answered for her as she smiled behind her tears, and all the while he talked, David's hand, as tender as a woman's, was passing back and forth on Marcia's hot forehead and smoothing the hair. He talked on quietly to soothe her and give her a chance to regain her composure, speaking of a few necessary arrangements for the morning's ride. Then he said, still in his quiet voice, Now, dear, I want you to go to bed, for we must start rather early but first do you think you could sing me that little song you were singing the day i came home don't if you feel too tired you know then marcia an eager light in her eyes sprang up and went to the piano and began to play softly and sing the tender words she had sung once before when he was listening and she knew it not dearest believe whene'er we part lonely i grieve in my sad heart kate standing within the chintz curtains across the yard shedding angry tears upon her purple silk heard presently the sweet tones of the piano which might have been hers heard her sister's voice singing and began to understand that she must bear the punishment of her own rash deeds the room had grown from a purple dusk into quiet darkness while marcia was singing for the sun was almost down when they walked home when the song was finished, David stood half-wistfully looking at Marcia for a moment. Her eyes shone to his through the dusk like two bright stars. He hesitated, as though he wanted to say something more, and then thought better of it. At last he stooped and lifted her hand from the keys and led her toward the door. "'You must go to sleep at once,' he said gently. "'You'll need all the rest you can get.' He lighted a candle for her and said good night with his eyes as well as his lips. Marcia felt that she was going up the stairs under a spell of some gentle loving power that surrounded her and would always guard her. 
it was about this time that miranda having been sent over to take a forgotten piece of bride's cake to marcia and having heard the piano and stolen discreetly to the parlor window for a moment returned and detailed for the delectation of that most unhappy guest mrs leavenworth why she could not get in and would have to take it over in the morning the window was open in the parlor and they were in there them too but they was so plumb took up with their two selves as they always are that there wasn't no use knockin for they'd never have heard miranda enjoyed making those remarks to the guest some keen instinct always told her where best to strike her blows when marcia had reached the top stair she looked down and there was david smiling up to her marcia he said in a tone that seemed half ashamed and half amused have you any that is things that you had before all your own i mean with quick intuition marcia understood and her own sweet shame about her clothes that were not her own came back upon her with double force she suddenly saw herself again standing before the censure of her sister she wondered if david had heard if not how then did he know oh the shame of it she sat down weakly upon the stair yes said she trying to think some old things and one frock wear it then to-morrow dear said david in a compelling voice and with the sweet smile that took the hurt out of his most severe words marcia smiled it's very plain she said only chins pink and white i made it myself charming said david wear it dear marcia one thing more don't wear any more things that don't belong to you not a dud promise me can you get along without it why i guess so said marcia laughing joyfully i'll try to manage but i haven't any bonnet nothing but a pink sunbonnet all right wear that said david it will look a little queer won't it said marcia doubtfully and yet as if the idea expressed a certain freedom which was grateful to her never mind said david wear it don't wear any more of those other things pack them all up and send them where they belong just as quick as we get home there was something masterful and delightful in david's voice and marcia with a happy laugh took her candle and got up saying with a ring of joy in her voice all right she went to her room with david's second good night ringing in her ears and her heart so light she wanted to sing not at once did marcia go to her bed she set her candle upon the bureau and began to search wildly in a little old haircloth trunk her own special old trunk that had contained her treasures and which had been sent her after she left home she had scarcely looked into it since she came to the new home it seemed as if her girlhood were shut up in it now she pulled it out from the closet what a flood of memories rushed over her as she opened it there were relics of her school days and of her little childhood but she had no time for them now she was in search of something she touched them tenderly but laid them all out one after another upon the floor until down in the lower corner she found a roll of soft white cloth it contained a number of white garments half a dozen perhaps in all finished and several others cut out barely begun they were her own work every stitch the first begun when she was quite a little girl and her stepmother started to teach her to sew what pride she had taken in them how pleased she had been when allowed to put real tucks in some of them she had thought as she sewed upon them at different times that they were to be a part of her own wedding trousseau and then her wedding had come upon her unawares with the trousseau ready made and everything belonged to some one else she had folded her own poor little garments away and thought never to take them out again for they seemed to belong to her dead self but now that dead self had suddenly come to life again these hated things that she had worn for a year that were not hers were to be put away and pretty as they were many of them she regretted not a thread of them she laid the white garments out upon a chair and decided that she would put on what she needed of them on the morrow 
even though they were rumpled with a long lying away. She even searched out an old pair of her own stockings and laid them on a chair with the other things. They were neatly darned, as all things had always been under her stepmother's supervision. Further search brought a pair of partly worn prunella slippers to light with narrow ankle ribbons. Then Marcia took down the pink sprigged chins that she had made a year ago and laid it near the other things, with a bit of black velvet and the quaint old brooch. She felt a little dubious about appearing on such a great occasion, almost in Albany, in a chin's dress and with no wrap. Stay, there was the white crepe shawl, all her own, that David had brought her. She had not felt like wearing it to Hannah Heath's wedding. It seemed too precious to take near an unloving person like Hannah. Before that she had never felt an occasion great enough. Now she drew it forth breathlessly. A white crepe shawl and a pink calico sunbonnet. Marcia laughed softly. But then, what matter, David had said to wear it. All things were ready for the morrow now. There were even her white lace mitts that Aunt Polly, in an unusual fit of benevolence, had given her. Then, as if to make the change complete, she searched out an old night robe, plain but smooth and clean, and arrayed herself in it. And so, thankful, happy, she lay down as she had been bidden, and fell asleep. David in the room below pondered, strange to say, the subject of dress. There was some pride beneath it all, of course. There always is behind the great problem of dress. It was the rejected bonnet lying in the corner with its blue ribbons limp and its blue flowers crushed that made that subject paramount among so many others he might have chosen for his night's meditation. He was going over to close the parlor window when he saw the thing lying innocent and discarded in the corner. Though it bore an injured look, it yet held enough of its original aristocratic style to cause him to stop and think. It was all well enough to suggest that Marcia wear a pink sunbonnet. It sounded deliciously picturesque. She looked lovely and pink, and a sunbonnet was pretty and sensible on any one. But the morrow was a great day. David would be seen of many, and his wife would come under strict scrutiny. Moreover, it was possible that Kate might be upon the scene to jeer at her sister in a sunbonnet. In fact, when he considered it, he would not like to take his wife to Albany in a sunbonnet. It behoved him to consider. The outrageous words which he had heard Mistress Leavenworth speak to his wife still burned in his brain like needles of torture revelation of the true character of the woman he had once longed to call his own. But that bonnet! He stood and examined it. What was a bonnet like? The proper kind of a bonnet for a woman in his wife's position to wear. He had never noticed a woman's bonnet before, except as he had absent-mindedly observed them in front of him in meeting. Now he brought his mind to bear upon that bonnet. It seemed to be made up of three component parts a foundation, a girdle apparently to bind together and tie on the head, and a decoration. Straw, silk, and some kind of unreal flowers. Was that all? He stooped down and picked the thing up with the tips of his fingers, held it at arm's length as though it were contaminating, and examined the inside. Ah, there was another element in its construction, a sort of frill of something thin, hardly lace, more like the foam of a cloud. He touched the tool clumsily with his thumb and finger, and then he dropped the bonnet back into the corner again. He thought he understood well enough to know one again. He stood pondering a moment and looked at his watch. Yes, it was still early enough to try at least, though of course the shop would be closed, but the village milliner lived behind her little store. It would be easy enough to rouse her, and he had known her all his life. He took his hat as eagerly as he had done when as a boy Aunt Clorinda had given him a penny to buy a top and permission to go to the store and buy it before Aunt Amelia woke up from her nap. He went rapidly out of the door, fastening it behind him, and walked rapidly down the street. Yes, the milliner's shop was closed, but a light in the side windows shining through the veiling hop vines guided him, and he was presently tapping at Miss Mitchell's side door. 
she opened the door cautiously and peeped over her glasses at him and then a bright smile overspread her face who in the whole village did not welcome david whenever he chanced to come miss mitchell was resting from her labors and reading the village paper she had finished the column of gossip and was quite ready for a visitor come right in david she said heartily for she had known him all the years it does a body good to see you though your visits are as few and far between as angels visits i'm right glad to see you sit down but david was too eager about his business i haven't any time to sit down to-night miss susan he said eagerly i've come to buy a bonnet have you got one i hope it isn't too late because i want it very early in the morning a bonnet bless me for yourself said miss mitchell from mere force of commercial habit but neither of them saw the joke so intent upon business were they for my wife miss mitchell you see she is going with me over to albany to-morrow morning and we start quite early we are going to see the new railroad train start you know and she seems to think she hasn't a bonnet that's suitable going to see a steam engine start are you well take care david you don't get too near they do say they're terrible dangerous things and for my part i can't see what good they'll be for nobody'll ever be willin to ride behind em but i'd like to see it start well enough and that sweet little wife of yours thinks she ain't got a good enough bonnet land sakes what is the matter with her dunstable straw and what's become of that one trimmed with blue lute strings and where's the sheared silk one she wore last sunday they're every one fine bonnets and ought to last her a good many years yet if she cares for em the mice haven't got into the house and et them have they no miss susan those bonnets are all whole yet i believe but they don't seem to be just the suitable thing in fact i don't think they're over becoming to her do you you see they're mostly blue that's so said miss mitchell i think myself she'd look better in pink how'd you like white i've got a pretty thing that i made for hannah heath and when it was done hannah thought it was too plain and wouldn't have it i sent for the flowers to new york and they cost a high price wait i'll show it to you she took a candle and he followed her to the dark front room ghostly with bonnets in various stages of perfection it was a pretty thing its foundation was of fine milan braid creamy white and smooth and even he knew at a glance it belonged to the higher order of things and was superior to most of the bonnets produced in the village it was trimmed with plain white taffeta ribbon soft and silky that was all on the outside around the face was a soft rushing of tulle and clambering along it a vine of delicate green leaves that looked as if they were just plucked from a wild rose bank david was delighted somehow the bonnet looked like marcia he paid the price at once declining to look at anything else it was enough that he liked it and that hannah heath had not he had never admired hannah's taste he carried it home in triumph letting himself softly into the house lighted three candles took the bonnet out and hung it upon a chair then he walked around it surveying it critically first from this side then from that it pleased him exceedingly he half wished marcia would hear him and come down he wanted to see it on her but concluded that he was growing boyish and had better get himself under control the bonnet approved he walked back and forth through the kitchen and dining-room thinking he compelled himself to go over the events of the afternoon and analyze most carefully his own innermost feelings in fact after doing that he began further back and tried to find out how he felt toward marcia what was this something that had been growing in him unaware through the months that had made his homecoming so sweet and had brightened every succeeding day and had made this meeting with kate a mere commonplace what was this precious thing that nestled in his heart might he had he a right to call it love surely now all at once his pulses thrilled with gladness he loved her it was good to love her she was the most precious being on earth to him what was kate in comparison to her 
kate who had shown herself cold and cruel and unloving in every way his anger flamed anew as he thought of those cutting sentences he had overheard taunting her own sister about the clothes she wore boasting that he still belonged to her she a married woman a woman who had of her own free will left him at the last moment and gone away with another his whole nature recoiled against her she had sinned against her womanhood and might no longer demand from man the homage that a true woman had a right to claim poor little bruised flower his heart went out to marcia he could not bear to think of her having to stand and listen to that heartless tirade and he had been the cause of all this he had allowed her to take a position which threw her open to kate's vile taunts up and down he paced till the torrent of his anger spent itself and he was able to think more calmly then he went back in his thoughts to the time when he had first met kate and she had bewitched him he could see now the heartlessness of her he had met her first at the house of a friend where he was visiting partly on pleasure partly on business she had devoted herself to him during the time of her stay in a most charming way though now he recalled that she had also been equally devoted to the son of the house whom he was visiting when she went home she had asked him to come and call for her home was but seven miles away he had been so charmed with her that he had accepted the invitation and rashly he saw now had engaged himself to her after having known her in all face to face but a few days to be sure he had known of her father for years and he took a great deal for granted on account of her fine family they had corresponded after their engagement which had lasted for nearly a year and in that time david had seen her but twice for a day or two at a time and each time he had thought her grown more lovely her letters had been marvels of modesty and shy admiration it was easy for kate to maintain her character upon paper though she had had little trouble in making people love her under any circumstances now as he looked back he could recall many instances when she had shown a cruel heartless nature then all at once with a throb of joy it came to him to be thankful to god for the experience through which he had passed after all it had not been taken from him to love with a love enduring for though kate had been snatched from him just at the moment of his possession marcia had been given him fool that he was he had been blind to his own salvation suppose he had been allowed to go on and marry kate suppose he had had her character revealed to him suddenly as those letters of hers to harry temple had revealed it as it surely would have been revealed in time for such things cannot be hid and she had been his wife he shuddered how he would have loathed her how he loathed her now strangely enough the realization of that fact gave him joy he sprang up and waved his hands about in silent delight he felt as if he must shout for gladness then he gravely knelt beside his chair and uttered an audible thanksgiving for the escape and the joy he had been given nothing else seemed fitting expression of his feelings there was one other question to consider marcia's feelings she had always been kind and gentle and loving to him just as a sister might have been she was exceedingly young yet did she know could she understand what it meant to be loved the way he was sure he could love a woman and would she ever be able to love him in that way she was so silent and shy he hardly knew whether she cared for him or not but there was one thought that gave him unbounded joy and that was that she was his wife at least no one else could take her from him he had felt condemned that he had married her when his heart was heavy lest she would lose the joy of life but all that was changed now unless she loved some one else surely such love as his could compel hers and finally make her as happy as a woman could be made a twinge of misgiving crossed his mind as he admitted the possibility that marcia might love some one else true he knew of no one and she was so young it was scarcely likely she had left any one back in her girlhood 
to whom her heart had turned when she was out of his sight still there were instances of strong union of hearts of those who had loved from early childhood it might be that marcia's sometime sadness was over a companion of her girlhood a great longing took possession of him to rush up and waken her and find out if she could ever care for him he scarcely knew himself this was not his dignified contained self that he had lived with for twenty-seven years it was very late before he finally went upstairs he walked softly lest he disturb marcia he paused before her door listening to see if she was asleep but there was only the sound of the katydids in the branches outside her window and the distant tree toads singing a fugue in an orchard not far away he tiptoed to his room but he did not light his candle therefore there was no light in the back room of the spafford house that night for any watching eyes to ponder over he threw himself upon the bed he was weary in body yet his soul seemed buoyant as a bird in the morning air the moon was casting long bars of silver across the rag carpet and white counterpane it was almost full moon yes tomorrow it would be entirely full it was full moon the night he had met marcia down by the gate and kissed her it was the first time he had thought of that kiss with anything but pain it used to hurt him that he had made the mistake and taken her for kate it had seemed like an ill omen of what was to come but now it thrilled him with a great new joy after all he had given the kiss to the right one it was marcia to whom his soul bowed in the homage that a man may give to a woman did his good angel guide him to her that night and how was it that he had not seen the sweetness of marcia sooner how had he lived with her nearly a year and watched her dainty ways and loving ministry and not known that his heart was hers how was it that he had grieved so long over kate and now since he had seen her once more not a regret was in his heart that she was not his but a beautiful revelation of his own love to marcia had been wrought in him how came it and the importunate little songsters in the night answered him a thousand times kate did it kate she did it yes she did i say she did kate did it had angel voices reached him through his dreams and suddenly given him the revelation which the little insects had voiced in their ridiculous colloquy it was kate herself who had shown him how much he loved marcia end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of marcia schuyler by grace livingston hill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Slowly the moon rode over the house and down toward its way in the west, and after its vanishing chariot the night stretched its wistful arms. Softly the gray in the east tinged into violet and glowed into rose and gold. The birds woke up and told one another that the first of August was come and life was good. The breath that came in the early dawn savored of new-mown hay, and the bird songs thrilled Marcia as if it were the day of her dreams. She forgot all her troubles, forgot even her wayward sister next door, and rose with the song of the birds in her heart. This was to be a great day. No matter what happened, she had now this day to date from. David had asked her to go somewhere just because he wanted her to she knew it from the look in his eyes when he told her and she knew it because he might have asked a dozen men to go with him there was no reason why he need have taken her to-day for it was distinctly an affair for men this great wonder of machinery it was a privilege for a woman to go she felt it she understood the honor with fingers trembling from joy she dressed not the sight of her pink calico sunbonnet lying on the chair nor the thought of wearing it upon so grand an occasion could spoil the pleasure of the day among so large a company her bonnet would hardly be noticed if david was satisfied what difference did it make she was glad it would be early when they drove by the ants else they might be scandalized but never mind trill she hummed a merry little tune which melted into the melody of the song she had sung last night 
then she smiled at herself in the glass she was fastening the brooch in the bit of velvet round her neck and she thought of the day a year ago when she had fastened that brooch she had wondered then how she would feel if the next day was to be her own wedding day now as she smiled back at herself in the glass all at once she thought it seemed as if this was her wedding day somehow last night had seemed to realize her dreams a wonderful joy had descended upon her heart maybe she was foolish but was she not going to ride with david she did not long for the green fields and a chance to run wild through the wood now this was better than those childish pleasures this was real happiness and to think it should have come through david she hurried with the arrangement of her hair until her fingers trembled with excitement she wanted to get downstairs and see if it were all really true or if she were dreaming it would david look at her as he had done last night would he speak that precious word dear to her again to-day would he take her by the hand and lead her sometimes or was that special gentleness because he knew she had suffered from her sister's words she clasped her hands with a quick convulsive gesture over her heart and looking back to the sweet face in the glass said softly oh i love him love him and it cannot be wrong for kate is married but though she was up early david had been down before her the fire was ready lighted and the kettle singing over it on the crane he had even pulled out the table and put up the leaf and made some attempt to put the dishes upon it for breakfast he was sitting by the hearth impatient for her coming with a bandbox by his side it was like another sunrise to watch their eyes light up as they saw one another their glances rushed together as though they had been a long time withholden from each other and a rosy glow came over marcia's face that made her long to hide it for a moment from view then she knew in her heart that her dream was not all a dream. David was the same. It had lasted whatever this wonderful thing was that bound them together. She stood still in her happy bewilderment, looking at him, and he, enjoying the radiant morning vision of her, stood too. David found that longing to take her in his arms overcoming him again. He had made strict account with himself and was resolved to be careful and not frighten her he must be sure it would not be unpleasant to her before he let her know his great deep love he must be careful he must not take advantage of the fact that she was his and could not run away from him if she dreaded his attentions neither could she any more say no and so their two looks met and longed to come closer but were held back and a lovely shyness crept over Marcia's sweet face. Then David bethought himself of his bandbox. He took up the box and untied it with unaccustomed fingers, fumbling among the tissue paper for the handle end of the thing. Where did they take hold of bonnets, anyway? He had no trouble with it the night before, but then he was not thinking about it. Now he was half afraid she might not like it. He remembered that Hannah Heath had pronounced against it it suddenly seemed impossible that he should have bought a bonnet that a pretty woman had said was not right there must be something wrong with it after all marcia stood wondering i thought maybe this would do instead of the sunbonnet he said at last getting out the bonnet by one string and holding it dangling before him marcia caught it with deft careful hands and an exclamation of delight he watched her anxiously it had all the requisite number of materials one two three four like the despised bonnet he threw on the floor straw silk lace and flowers would she like it her face showed that she did her cheeks flushed with pleasure and her eyes danced with joy marcia's face always showed it when she liked anything there was nothing halfway about her oh it is beautiful she said delightedly it is so sweet and white and cool with that green vine oh i am glad 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 i shall never wear that old blue bonnet again she went over to the glass and put it on the soft rushing settled about her brown hair and made a lovely setting for her face the green vine twined and peeped in and out under the round brim and the ribbon sat in a prim bow beneath her pretty chin 
she gave one comprehensive glance at herself in the glass and then turned to david in that glance was revealed to her just how much she had dreaded wearing her pink sunbonnet and just how relieved she was to have a substitute her look was shy and sweet as she said with eyes that dared and then drooped timidly you are very good to me almost he forgot his vow of carefulness at that but remembered when he had got half across the room toward her and answered earnestly dear you have been very good to me marcia's eyes suddenly sobered and half the glow faded from her face was it then only gratitude she took off the bonnet and touched the bows with wistful tenderness as she laid it by till after breakfast he watched her and misinterpreted the look was she then disappointed in the bonnet was it not right after all had hannah known better than he he hesitated and then asked her is there is it that is perhaps you would rather take it back and and choose another you know how to choose one better than i there were others i think in fact i forgot to look at any but this because i liked it but i'm only a man he finished helplessly no 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 said marcia her eyes sparkling emphatically again there couldn't be a better one this is just exactly what i like i do not want anything else and i like it all the better because you selected it she said daringly suddenly lifting her face to his with a spice of her own childish freedom his eyes admired her she told me hannah heath thought it too plain he added honestly then i'm sure i like it all the better for that said marcia so emphatically that they both laughed it all at once became necessary to hurry for the old clock in the hall clanged out the hour and david became aware that haste was imperative early as marcia had come down david had been up long before her his heart too light to sleep in a dream or perchance on the borders of the morning an idea had come to him he told marcia that he must go out now to see about the horse but he also made a hurried visit to the home of his office clerk and another to the aunts and when he returned with the horse he had left things in such a train that if he did not return that evening he would not be greatly missed but he said nothing to marcia about it he laughed to himself as he thought of the sleepy look on his clerk's face and the offended dignity expressed in the ruffle of aunt hortense's nightcap all awry as she had peered over the balusters to receive his unprecedentedly early visit the aunts were early risers they prided themselves upon it it hurt their dignity and their pride to have anything short of sudden serious illness or death or a fire cause others to arise before them therefore they did not receive the message that david was meditating another trip away from the village for a few days with good grace aunt hortense asked aunt amelia if she had ever feared that marcia would have a bad effect upon david by making him frivolous perhaps he would lose interest in his business with all his careering around the country aunt amelia agreed that marcia must be to blame in some way and then discovering they had a whole hour before their usual rising time the two good ladies settled themselves with indignant composure to their interrupted repose breakfast was ready when david returned marcia supposed he had only been to harness the horse she glanced out happily through the window to where the horse stood tied to the post in front of the house she felt like waving her hand to him and he turned and seemed to see her rolling the whites of his eyes around and tossing his head as if in greeting marcia could scarcely have eaten anything in her excitement if david had not urged her to do so she hurried with her clearing away and then flew upstairs to arrange her bonnet before the glass and don the lovely folds of the creamy crepe shawl folding it demurely around her shoulders and knotting it in front she put on her mitts took her handkerchief folded primly and came down ready but david no longer seemed in such haste he made a great fuss fastening up everything she wondered at his unusual care for she thought everything quite safe for the day she raised one shade toward the heath house it was the first time she had permitted herself this morning to think of kate was she there yet 
probably for no coach had left since last night and unless she had gone by private conveyance there would have been no way to go she looked up to the front corner guest room where the windows were open and the white muslin curtains swayed in the morning breeze no one seemed to be moving about in the room perhaps kate was not awake just then she caught the flutter of a blue muslin down on the front stoop kate was up early as it was and was coming out a sudden misgiving seized marcia's heart as when a little child she had seen her sister coming to eat up the piece of cake or sweetmeat that had been given to her many a time had that happened now she felt in some mysterious way kate would contrive to take from her her new-found joy she could not resist her david could not resist her no one could ever resist kate her face turned white and her hand began to tremble so that she dropped the curtain she had been holding up just then came david's clear voice louder than would have been necessary and pitched as if he were calling to some one upstairs though he knew she was just inside the parlor where she had gone to make sure of the window fastening come dear aren't you ready it is more than time we started there was a glad ring in david's voice that somehow belied the somewhat exacting words he had spoken and marcia's heart leaped up to meet him yes i'm all ready dear she called back with a hysterical little laugh of course kate could not hear so far but it gave her satisfaction to say it the final word was unpremeditated it bubbled up out of the depths of her heart and made the red rush back into her cheeks when she realized what she had said it was the first time she had ever used a term of endearment toward david she wondered if he noticed it and if he would think her very bold queer immodest to use it she looked shyly up at him inquiring with her eyes as she came out to him on the front stoop and he looked down with such a smile she felt as if it were a caress and yet neither was quite conscious of this little real by-play they were enacting for the benefit of the audience of one in blue muslin over the way how much she heard or how little they could not tell but it gave satisfaction to go through with it inasmuch as it was real and not acting at all david fastened the door and then helped marcia into the carriage they were both laughing happily like two children starting upon a picnic marcia was serenely conscious of her new bonnet and it was pleasant to have david tuck the linen lap robe over her chin's frock so carefully she was certain kate could not identify it now at that distance thanks to the lap robe and her crepe shawl at least kate could not see any of her own trousseau on her sister now kate was sitting on the little white seat in the shelter of the honeysuckle vine facing them on the stoop of the heath house it was impossible for them to know whether she was watching them or not they did not look up to see she was talking with mr heath who in his milking garb was putting to rights some shrubs and plants near the walk that had been trampled upon during the wedding festivities but kate must have seen a good deal that went on david took up the reins settled himself with a smile at marcia touched the horse with the tip of the whip which caused him to spring forward in astonishment that from david no horse in town would have expected it of him they had known him from babyhood most of them and he was gentleness itself it must have been a mistake but the impression lasted long enough to carry them a rod or two past the heath house at a swift pace with only time for a lifting of david's hat prolonged politely which might or might not have included kate and they were out upon their way together marcia could scarcely believe her senses that she was really here beside david riding with him swiftly through the village and leaving kate behind she felt a passing pity for kate then she looked shyly up at david would his gaiety pass when they were away and would he grow grave and sad again so soon as he was out of kate's sight she had learned enough of david's principles to know that he would not think it right to let his thoughts stray to kate now but did his heart still turn that way in spite of him through the town they sped glad with every roll of the wheels that took them further away from kate each was conscious as they rolled along of that day one year ago when they rode together thus out through the fields into the country 
it was a day much as that other one just as bright just as warm and yet oh so much more radiant to both then they were sad and fearful for the future all their life seemed in the past now the darkness had been led through and they had reached the brightness again in fact all the future stretched out before them that fair morning and looked bright as the day they were conscious of the blueness of the sky of the soft clouds that hovered in haziness on the rim of the horizon as holding off far enough to spoil no moment of that perfect day they were conscious of the waving grains and of the perfume of the buckwheat drifting like snow in the fields beyond the wheat conscious of the meadow-lark and the wood-robin's note of the whir of a locust and the thud of a frog in the cool green of a pool deep with brown shadows conscious of a circling of mated butterflies in the simmering gold air of the wild roses lifting fair pink petals from the brambly banks beside the road conscious of the whispering pine needles in a wood they passed the fluttering chatter of leaves and silver flash of the lining of poplar leaves where tall trees stood like sentinels apart and sad conscious of a little brook that tinkled under a log bridge they crossed then hurried on its way unmindful of their happy crossing conscious of the dusty daisy beside the road closing with the bumbling bee who wanted honey below the market price conscious of all these things yet most conscious of each other close side by side it was all so dear that ride and over so soon marcia was just trying to get used to looking up into the dazzling light of david's eyes she had to droop her own almost immediately for the truth she read in his was overpowering could it be a fluttering thought came timidly to her heart and would not be denied can it be can it be that he cares for me he loves me he loves me it sang its way in with thrill after thrill of joy and more and more david's eyes told the story which his lips dared not risk yet but eyes and hearts are not held by the conventions that bind lips they rushed into the inheritance of each other and had that day ahead a day so rare and sweet that it would do to set among the jewels of fair days for all time and for any one all too soon they began to turn into roads where there were other vehicles many of them and all going in the same direction men and women in gala day attire all laughing and talking expectantly and looking at one another as the carriages passed with a degree of familiar curiosity which betokens a common errand family coaches farm wagons with kitchen chairs for accommodation of the family old one-horse chaises carryalls and even a stage-coach or two wheeled into the old turnpike david and marcia settled into subdued quiet their joy not expressing itself in the ripples of laughter that had rung out earlier in the morning when they were alone they sought each other's eyes often and often and in one of these excursions that david's eyes made to marcia's face he noticed how extremely becoming the new bonnet was after thinking it over he decided to risk letting her know he was not shy about it now do you know dear he said there had been a good many dears slipping back and forth all unannounced during that ride and not openly acknowledged either do you know how becoming your new bonnet is to you you look prettier than i ever saw you look but once before he kept his eyes upon her face and watched the sweet color steal up to her drooping eyelashes when was that she asked coyly to hide her embarrassment and sweeping him one laughing glance why that night dear at the gate in the moonlight don't you remember oh marcia caught her breath and a thrill of joy passed through her that made her close her eyes lest the glad tears should come then the little bird in her heart set up the song in earnest to the tune of wonder he loves me he loves me he loves me he leaned a little closer to her if there were not so many people looking i think i should have to kiss you now oh said marcia drawing in her breath and looking around frightened on the number of people that were driving all about them for they were come almost to the railroad now and could see the black smoke of the engine a little beyond as it stood puffing and snorting upon its track 
like some sulky animal that had been caught and chained and harnessed and was longing to leap forward and upset its load but though marcia looked about in her happy fright and sat a little straighter in the chaise she did not move her hand away that lay next david's underneath the linen lap-robe and he put his own hand over it and covered it close in his firm hold marcia trembled and was so happy she was almost faint with joy she wondered if she were very foolish indeed to feel so and if all love had this terrible element of solemn joy in it that made it seem too great to be real they had to stop a number of times to speak to people everybody knew david it appeared this man and that had a word to speak with him some bit of news that he must not omit to notice in his article some new development about the attitude of a man of influence that was important the change of two or three of those who were to go in the coaches on this trial trip to all of them david introduced his wife with a ring of pride in his voice as he said the words my wife and all of them stopped whatever business they had in hand and stepped back to bow most deferentially to the beautiful woman who sat smiling by his side they wondered why they had not heard of her before and they looked curiously enviously at david and back in admiration at marcia it was quite a little court she held sitting there in the chaise by david's side men who have since won a mention in the pages of history were there that day and nearly all of them had a word for david spafford and his lovely wife many of them stood for some time and talked with her mr thurlow weed was the last one to leave them before the train was actually ready for starting and he laid an urging hand upon david's arm as he went then you think you cannot go with us better come mrs spafford will let you i am sure you are not afraid are you mrs spafford i am sure you are a brave woman better come spafford but david laughingly thanked him again as he had thanked others and said that he would not be able to go as he and his wife had other plans and he must go on to albany as soon as the train had started marcia looked up at him half worshipfully as he said this wondering what it was instinctively knowing that it was for her sake he was giving up this honor which they all wished to put upon him it would naturally have been an interesting thing to him to have taken this first ride behind the new engine dewitt clinton then suddenly like a chill wind from a thundercloud that has stolen up unannounced and clutched the little wild flowers before they have time to bind up their windy locks and duck their heads under cover there happened a thing that clutched marcia's heart and froze all the joy in her veins End of chapter twenty eight Chapter twenty nine of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty nine. A coach was approaching, filled with people. Some of them Marcia knew. They were friends and neighbors from their own village. And behind it, plodding along, came a horse with a strangely familiar gait, drawing four people. The driver was old Mister Heath, looking unbelievingly at the scene before him he did not believe that an engine would be able to haul a train any appreciable distance whatever and he believed that he had come out here to witness this entire company of fanatics circumvented by the ill-natured iron steed who stood on the track ahead surrounded by gaping boys and a flock of quacking ganders living symbol of the people who had come to see the thing start so thought mr heath he told himself he was as much of a goose as any of them to have let this chit of a woman fool him into coming off out here when he ought to have been in the hayfield to-day by his side in all the glory of shimmering blue with a wide white lace bertha and a bonnet with a steeple crown wreathed about heavily with roses sat kate a blue silk parasol shading her eyes from the sun those eyes that looked to conquer and seemed to pierce beyond and through her sister and ignore her old mrs heath and miranda were along but they did not count except to themselves miranda was all eyes under an ugly bonnet she desired above all things to see that wonderful engine in which david was so interested 
Marcia shrunk and seemed to wither where she sat. All her bright bloom faded in an instant, and a kind of frenzy seized her. She had a wild desire to get down out of the carriage and run with all her might away from this hateful scene. The sky seemed to have suddenly clouded over, and the hum and buzz of voices about seemed a babble that would never cease. David felt the arm beside his cringe and shrink back, and looking down saw the look upon her sweet frightened face. Following her glance, his own face hardened into what might have been termed righteous wrath. But not a word did he say, and neither did he apparently notice the oncoming carriage. He busied himself at once talking with a man who happened to pass the carriage, and when Mr. Heath drove by to get a better view of the engine, he was so absorbed in his conversation that he did not notice them, which seemed but natural. But Kate was not to be thus easily foiled. She had much at stake, and she must win if possible. She worked it about that Squire Heath should drive around to the end of the line of coaches, quite out of sight of the engine, and where there was little chance of seeing the train and its passengers, the only thing Squire Heath cared about. But there was an excellent view of David's carriage, and Kate would be within hailing distance if it should transpire that she had no further opportunity of speaking with David. It seemed strange to Squire Heath, as he sat there behind the last coach patiently, that he had done what she asked. She did not look like a woman who was timid about horses, yet she had professed a terrible fear that the screech of the engine should frighten the staid old Heath horse. Miranda, at that, had insisted upon changing seats, thereby getting herself nearer the horse and the scene of action. Miranda did not like to miss seeing the engine start. At last, word to start was given. A man ran along by the train and mounted into his high seat with his horn in his hand ready to blow. The fireman ceased his raking of the glowing fire, and every traveller sprang into his seat and looked toward the crowd of spectators importantly. This was a great moment for all interested. The little ones whose fathers were in the train began to call good-bye and wave their hands, and one old lady whose only son was going as one of the train assistants began to sob aloud. A horse in the crowd began to act badly. Every snort of the engine as the steam was let off made him start and rear. He was directly behind Marcia, and she turned her head and looked straight into his fiery frightened eyes, red with fear and frenzy, and felt his hot breath upon her cheek. A man was trying most ineffectually to hold him, but it seemed as if in another minute he would come plunging into the seat with them. Marcia uttered a frightened cry and clutched at David's arm. He turned, and seeing instantly what was the matter, placed his arm protectingly about her, and at once guided his own horse out of the crowd and around nearer to the engine. Somehow that protecting arm gave Marcia a steadiness once more, and she was able to watch the wonderful wheels begin to turn, and the whole train slowly move and start on its way. Her lips parted, her breath came quick, and for the instant she forgot her trouble. David's arm was still about her, and there was a reassuring pressure in it. He seemed to have forgotten that the crowd might see him if the crowd had not been too busy watching something more wonderful. It is probable that only one person in that whole company saw David sitting with his arm about his wife, for he soon remembered and put it quietly on the back of the seat, where it would call no one's attention, and that person was Kate. She had not come to this hot dusty place to watch an engine creak along a track. She had come to watch David, and she was vexed and angry at what she saw. Here was Marcia flaunting her power over David directly in her face. Spiteful thing! She would pay her back yet, and let her know that she could not touch the things that she, Kate, had put her own sign and seal upon. For this reason it was that at the last minute Kate allowed poor Squire Heath to drive around near the front of the train, saying that as David Spafford seemed to find it safe, she supposed she ought not to hold them back for her fears. It needed but the word to send the vexed and curious squire around through the crowd to a spot directly behind David's carriage, 
and there Miranda could see quite well, and Kate could sit and watch David and frame her plans for immediate action so soon as the curtain should fall upon this ridiculous engine play over which everybody was wild. And so, amid shouts and cheers, and squawking of the geese that attempted to precede the engine like a white frightened bodyguard down the track, amid the waving of handkerchiefs, the shouts of excited little boys, and the neighing of frightened horses, the first steam engine that ever drew a train in New York State started upon its initial trip. Then there came a great hush upon the spectators assembled. The wheels were rolling, the carriages were moving, the train was actually going by them, and what had been so long talked about was an assured fact. They were seeing it with their own eyes, and might be witnesses of it to all their acquaintances. It was true. They dared not speak nor breathe, lest something should happen and the great miracle should stop. They hushed simultaneously as though at the passing of some great soul. They watched in silence until the train went on between the meadows, grew smaller in the distance, slipped into the shadow of the wood, flashed out into the sunlight beyond again, and then was lost behind a hill. A low murmur growing rapidly into a shout of cheer arose as the crowd turned and faced one another and the fact of what they had seen. "'By gum, she can do it!' ejaculated Squire Heath, who had watched the melting of his skeptical opinions in speechless amazement. The words were the first intimation the Spaffords had of the proximity of Kate. They made David smile, but Marcia turned white with sudden fear again. Not for nothing had she lived with her sister so many years. She knew that cruel nature and dreaded it. David looked at Marcia for sympathy in his smile at the old squire, but when he saw her face, he turned frowning toward those behind him. Kate saw her opportunity. She leaned forward with honeyed smile, and wily as the serpent addressed her words to Marcia, loud and clear enough for all those about them to hear. Oh, Mrs. Spafford, I am going to ask a great favor of you. I am sure you will grant it when you know I have so little time. I am extremely anxious to get a word of advice from your husband upon business matters that are very pressing. Would you kindly change places with me during the ride home and give me a chance to talk with him about it? I would not ask it but that I must leave for New York on the evening coach and shall have no other opportunity to see him. Kate's smile was roses and cream touched with frosty sunshine, and to onlookers nothing could have been sweeter. But her eyes were coldly cruel as sharpened steel, and they said to her sister as plainly as words could have spoken, Do you obey my wish, my lady, or I will freeze the heart out of you? Marcia turned white and sick. She felt as if her lips had suddenly stiffened and refused to obey her when they ought to have smiled. What would all these people think of her and how she was behaving? For David's sake, she ought to do something, say something, look something. But what, what should she do? While she was thinking this, with the freezing in her heart creeping up to her throat, the great tears beating at the portals of her eyes, and time standing suddenly still waiting for her leaden tongue to speak, David answered. All gracefully t'was done, with not so much as a second's hesitation, though it had seemed so long to Marcia, nor the shadow of a sign that he was angry. Mrs. Leavenworth, he said in his masterful voice, I am sure my wife would not wish to seem ungracious or unwilling to comply with your request, but as it happens, it is impossible. We are not returning home for several days. My wife has some shopping to do in Albany, and in fact we are expecting to take a little trip. A sort of second honeymoon, you know, he added, smiling toward Mrs. Heath and Miranda. It is the first time I have had leisure to plan for it since we were married. I am sorry I have to hurry away, but I am sure that my friend Squire Heath can give as much help in a business way as I could, and furthermore, Squire Schuyler is now in New York for a few days, as I learned in a letter from him which arrived last evening. I am sure he can give you more and better advice than any I could give. I wish you good morning. 
Good morning, Mrs. Heath. Good morning, Miss Miranda. Lifting his hat, David drove away from them and straight over to the little wayside hostelry where he was to finish his article to send by the messenger who was even then ready mounted for the purpose. My, don't he think a lot of her, though, said Miranda, rolling the words as a sweet morsel under her tongue. It must be nice to have a man so fond of you. This was one of the occasions when Miranda wished she had eyes in the back of her head. She was sharp, and she had seen a thing or two. Also, she had heard scraps of her cousin Hannah's talk. But she sat demurely in the recesses of her deep, ugly bonnet, and tried to imagine how the guest behind her looked. All trembling sat Marcia in the rusty parlor of the little hostelry, while David at the table wrote with hurried hand, glancing up to her to smile now and then, and passing over the sheets as he finished them for her criticism. She thought she had seen the heath wagon drive away in the home direction, but she was not sure. She half expected to see the door open and Kate walk in. Her heart was thumping so she could hardly sit still, and the brightness of the world outside seemed to make her dizzy. She was glad to have the sheets to look over, for it took her thoughts away from herself and her nameless fears. She was not quite sure what it was she feared, only that in some way Kate would have power over David to take him away from her. As he wrote, she studied the dear lines of his face, and knew, as well as human heart may ever know, how dear another soul had grown to hers. David had not much to write, and it was soon signed, approved, and sealed. He sent his messenger on the way, and then coming back, closed the door and went and stood before Marcia. As though she felt some critical moment had come, she arose, trembling, and looked into his eyes questioningly. Marcia, he said, and his tone was grave and earnest, putting her upon an equality with him, not as if she were a child any more. Marcia, I have come to ask your forgiveness for the terrible thing I did to you in allowing you, who scarcely knew what you were doing then, to give your life away to a man who loved another woman. Marcia's heart stood still with horror. It had come then, that dreadful thing she had feared. The blow was going to fall. He did not love her. What a fool she had been! But the steady voice went on, though the blood in her neck and temples throbbed in such loud waves that she could scarcely hear the words to understand them. It was a crime, Marcia, and I have come to realize it more and more, during all the days of this year, that you have so uncomplainingly spent yourself for me. I know now, as I did not think then in my careless, selfish sorrow, that I was as cruel to you with your sweet young life as your sister was cruel to me. You might already have given your heart to someone else. I never stopped to inquire. You might have had plans and hopes for your own future. I never even thought of it. I was a brute. Can you forgive me? Sometimes the thought of the responsibility I took upon myself has been so terrible to me that I felt I could not stand it. You did not realize what it was then that you were giving, perhaps, but somehow I think you have begun to realize now. Will you forgive me? He stopped and looked at her anxiously. She was drooped and white as if a blast had suddenly struck her and faded her sweet bloom. Her throat was hot and dry, and she had to try three times before she could frame the words, Yes, I forgive. There was no hope, no joy in the words, and a sudden fear descended upon David's heart. Had he then done more damage than he knew? Was the child's heart broken by him, and did she just realize it? What could he do? Must he conceal his love from her? Perhaps this was no time to tell it, but he must. He could not bear the burden of having done her harm, and not also tell her how he loved her. He would be very careful, very considerate. He would not press his love as a claim, but he must tell her. And Marcia, I must tell you the rest he went on, his own words seeming to stay upon his lips, and then tumble over one another. I have learned to love you as I never loved your sister. 
I love you more and better than I ever could have loved her. I can see how God has led me away from her and brought me to you. I can look back to that night when I came to her and found you there waiting for me and kissed you, darling. Do you remember? He took her cold little trembling hands and held them firmly as he talked, his whole soul in his face, as if his life depended upon the next few moments. I was troubled at the time, dear, for having kissed you, and given you the greeting that I thought belonged to her. I have rebuked myself for thinking since how lovely you looked as you stood there in the moonlight. But afterward I knew that it was you, after all, that my love belonged to, and to you rightfully the kiss should have gone. I am glad it was so, glad that God overruled my foolish choosing. Lately I have been looking back to that night I met you at the gate, and feeling jealous that that meeting was not all ours, that it should be shadowed for us by the heartlessness of another. It gives me much joy now to think how I took you in my arms and kissed you. I cannot bear to think it was a mistake. Yet glad as I am that God sent you down to that gate to meet me, and much as I love you, I would rather have died than feel that I have brought sorrow into your life, and bound you to one to whom you cannot love. Marcia, tell me truly, never mind my feelings, tell me. Can you ever love me? Then did Marcia lift her flower-like face, all bright with tears of joy and a flood of rosy smiles, the light of seven stars in her eyes. But she could not speak. She could only, after a little, whisper, Oh, David, I think I have always loved you. I think I was waiting for you that night, though I did not know it. And look! with sudden thought. She drew from the folds of her dress a little old-fashioned locket hung by a chain about her neck out of sight. She opened it and showed him a soft gold curl, which she touched gently with her lips, as though it were something very sacred. "'What is it, darling?' asked David, perplexed, half happy, half afraid as he took the locket and touched the curl, more thrilled with the thought that she had carried it next to her heart than with the sight of it. "'It is yours,' she said, disappointed that he did not understand. "'Aunt Clorinda gave it to me while you were away. I've worn it ever since. And she gave me other things and told me all about you. I know it all, about the tops and the marbles and the spelling book, and I've cried with you over your punishments, and I love it all.' He had fastened the door before he began to talk, but he caught her in his arms now, regardless of the fact that the shades were not drawn down, and that they swayed in the summer breeze. "'Oh, my darling, my wife!' he cried, and kissed her lips for the third time. The world was changed then for those two. They belonged to each other, they believed, as no two that ever walked through Eden had ever belonged. When they thought of the precious bond that bound them together, their hearts throbbed with a happiness that well nigh overwhelmed them. A dinner of stewed chickens and little white soda biscuits was served them, fit for a wedding breakfast, for the maid whispered to the cook that she was sure there was a bride and groom in the parlor, they looked so happy, and seemed to forget everybody else was by. But it might have been ham and eggs, for all they knew what it was they ate, these two who were so happy they could but look into each other's eyes. When the dinner was over and they started on their way again, with Albany shimmering in the hot sun in the distance, and David's arm sliding from the top of the seat to circle Marcia's waist, David whispered, This is our real wedding journey, dearest, and this is our bridal day. We'll go to Albany and buy you a trousseau, and then we will go wherever you wish. I can stay a whole week if you wish. Would you like to go home for a visit? Marcia, with shining eyes and glowing cheeks, looked her love into his face and answered, Yes, now I would like to go home, just for a few days and then back to our home. And David, looking into her eyes, understood why she had not wanted to go before. She was taking her husband, her husband, not Kate's, with her now, and might be proud of his love. She could go among her old comrades and be happy, for he loved her. He looked a moment, comprehended, sympathized, 
and then pressing her hand close, for he might not kiss her as there was a load of hay coming their way, he said, Darling. But their eyes said more. End of chapter 29 End of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill Read by Tricia G.